We have a combination tonight of um, FJMC participants, some of my very good friends from Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, and my Temple Emanuel friends, Temple Emanuel in Newton. Um, and so welcome everyone to this special FJMC webinar. Um, so it's not really affinity group, it's sort of something we're just doing. Uh, thinking that April is the most appropriate month to have a webinar like this. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. I wanted to introduce Rachel to you, Rachel Sorodi, who is the author of the book that she's going to talk about tonight called We Share the Same Sky. Um, my Temple Emanuel Brotherhood book club actually read the book uh, and David Greenfield who is both FJMC and Temple Emanuel is actually the one who put us in touch with Rachel. So I'll just tell you a little bit. She's an award-winning photographer, writer, educator, and audio producer. And in 2019, she released her critically acclaimed podcast, also titled, We Share the Same Sky, about her grandmother's <clears throat> war story. And what's really cool is, the show is the first ever narrative podcast based on a Holocaust survivor's testimony and was listed as one of the best podcasts of the year by Huffington Post. So Rachel is, uh, I believe, originally uh, New England from the Boston area. But uh, after you hear a little bit about her story, you will know that she is very well traveled. Um, and that's really what brings us here tonight. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, and uh, we'll take it from there. So welcome, Rachel, and floor is yours. All right. You well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I, like I said, it's always so nice to do these when I can see other people's faces. So I really kind of feel like we're all together. Um, and thank you, Danny, for bringing me in and for David for suggesting this book to the, the reading group. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Rachel. I'm originally from Boston. I grew up, for those familiar with the area, I grew up in Jamaica Plain. I went to high school in Brookline. And up before I moved to Maine, which is where I'm talking to you from now, I live in Portland, Maine. I was actually living in Newton. So very close to Temple Emanuel. Um, and I, back when I was 20 years old, I was one of those college students who um, did one of those things where I like didn't listen to my parents where they kept telling me I should go to a small liberal arts college and I said no I'm gonna go to the biggest school I can find in a big city uh, that's not Boston and so I headed to Philadelphia for school and it certainly was not the right place for me uh, what was that <laughs> oh, oh, so everyone please mute yeah, sorry oh. <laughs> um, and uh, so I ended up going to school in Philly and um, really was dedicated to being a photojournalist. That was like my plan in life. That was like all I could focus on. Um, and like many young storytellers were told in that era of storytelling, it was pick a story and start a blog. So that was kind of the advice I was getting from folks older than me. And I thought, well, my grandmother has an interesting story. So that was, that is what started to like plant the seeds of maybe uh, looking a little bit deeper into my family history. And so when I was um, going into my junior year of college, I was actually set to go study abroad in Israel. And the summer prior to that, I said to my grandmother, I said, Muti, you know, called her Muti, um, you know, will you tell me your story? And she was like, oh, you've heard it before, which I had. Um, and after a little bit of pushing and prodding, um, uh, we started to talk. So I always knew that my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor growing up, that it was common knowledge in our family that she had been the only survivor in her family. We knew that she was on her own from the age of 14. Um, we knew that her, you know, the rest of her family had been killed in the camps, but she was saved by the kindness of strangers. And so her story, as she put it, was an uplifting one. And that, that those are her words, not mine. Um, and so, you know, the Holocaust was so woven into my identity, as was uh, the fact that my other grandparents were all from Europe. My mom came from uh, European Jews. Uh, my grandmother was from Czechoslovakia. Her father was from Germany. My father came from um, Danes and Italians. And um, so I always knew that, you know, my European heritage was pretty important. So anyways, I, I want to go into photojournalism. I'm interested in my grandmother's stories. We start these storytelling sessions. 
And I had no idea at that time that these very informal, not professional at all, storytelling sessions would become not only the backbone of my professional life um, every day since then, but also my personal life. So before we kick off in conversation, because I think for a good part of this, Danny and I will talk, and then I really welcome any and all questions that come in. I would love for this to feel conversational. Um, but prior to that, for folks who aren't familiar with the story, I'm just going to give you a little insight in through a couple passages in the book. So like I said, I always knew that my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. And, you know, after she passed away, which was about a year and a half after she and I started speaking, she died in October of 2010. I discovered that she left behind this incredible archive. And I was a senior in college at the time. Um, eventually, you know, when I graduated, I moved back to Boston. And when moving back to Boston, um, I don't even remember like exactly how I, you know, at what period of time I started getting everything, but I essentially just dubbed myself the unofficial family historian and started um, taking just her stuff with me. And she left behind absolutely beautiful artifacts. And I'm going to tell you more about those in a moment. But first, I just want to speak to the fact that even when I was very, very, very young, like to the point where I couldn't, um, even comprehend her story, she left behind breadcrumbs. So the book actually starts, the prologue of the book is a letter that my grandmother writes to me in 1992 when I am three years old. Um, and it's, it's a, I found it in her archive after she passed away. It's a hand, well, it must've been my mother saved it, but it was a handwritten back and forth multi-page letter that is telling me all about the week that we had just spent together in Maine, the state that I live in now, um, you know, our, our time together, what it was like, her memories of me, but then she goes on to tell me all about the world. So I just wanted to read a small, a small piece of that. Um, so again, she writes this in 1992 and she says, I often think how lucky I am, how lucky Ima is, how lucky you are having such a loving extended family. Your Ima didn't have the pleasure of or the luxury of having grandparents. She, as well as Aunt Nina and Uncle Peter, had only a nuclear family. When you're much older and I'm still around, I'll tell you about it. The world was bad, crazy, and vengeful then. And today, half a century later, it's not better by much. People will always fight for one reason or another and kill each other. We're in August, 1992. <clears throat> we had presidential elections. George Bush is president and wants to be again next term. Bill Clinton, Democrat, is running against him. The 25th Olympic Games are happening, are taking place in Barcelona, Spain. In Somalia, children by the hundreds are dying of hunger and illness. Israel has a new prime minister, Rabin, who is more willing to give into Palestinian demands than his predecessor, Shamir, was. There's a terrible civil war in Yugoslavia. Serbs are killing Croats and vice versa. Small children are killed and are separated from their parents for no reason and no fault. They didn't do anything bad. And then she goes on further. Um, but I, I, I have been, I had this letter in my heart since the day I found it as an adult because I just, you know, it kind of sets the stage a little bit of who my grandmother was, that when I was three years old, this is what she was writing me. So when we started uh, these storytelling sessions, like I said, I was 20 years old. I was going into my junior year of college. Um, I was actually getting ready to go abroad to Hebrew University, where I spent a year at the International School in Jerusalem. Um, and, you know, throughout this time we would talk and we had these storytelling sessions together. And uh, being that I wasn't super content with my college in Philly, my like, the big reason that gave me purpose of being there and like making my way through those years of school was really my grandmother's story. So I'm gonna read a small piece from the very beginning of the book. We share the same sky. Um, that is just gonna introduce you to how um, how I'm here a decade and a half later, still working with her story. So I write, <clears throat> on October 8th, 2010, Mati passed away. <clears throat> there were no tubes or sterile walls. There were no doctors dictating visiting hours or nurses checking her vitals. Hannah died at home, a place that she had fought so many times over to create for herself. Her body lay peacefully, it was the first time I touched a dead body, but I didn't cry. My memory is in black and white. 
I remember her skin being cold and soft. I took her hand and kissed it. Surrounding her were her pictures, her writings, and the delicate pages that proved her past. It was everything that I, unknowingly at that time, would come to wrap my world around. In the years after her death, I uncovered the most beautiful archive of her life. It wasn't a hidden archive or a secret one. It was just what she had left behind. It was everything she had told me, curated and edited. There were preserved albums and hundreds of photographs dating back to the 1920s. There were letters waiting to be translated, journals, diaries, deportation, and immigration papers. There were pieces of creative writing from various stages of her life, some marked up with line edits. The archive was seemingly endless. Every time I thought I had found the last box, I discovered another. There were repeated stories, some written at age 14 and others at age 80. There were anecdotes and memories that contradicted each other, bringing the question of memory into all of her stories. There were childhood report cards and souvenirs from her cross-country travels. There were confessions of love, secrets intended to stay private, and flashbacks never intended to be understood. She had written about being a daughter, a sister, a granddaughter, and a cousin, a friend, a student, and a dedicated member of her youth group. She was a strong-willed teen, a refugee, and an orphan. She was a survivor and a victim, a wanderer and someone who dreamed of home. She was a hopeful immigrant and a forced emigrant. She was an urban dweller and a farmer. She was a pioneer and a storyteller. She was a Czech child, a stateless teen, and an American wife. She was a traveler, an explorer, a teacher, and a student. She spoke six languages. She was a divorcee to one and a reignited flame to another. And for other men, she was the one who got away. She was a bride, a mother, a grandmother, and a grandmother, a young person searching for her future and an elderly person watching her grandchildren search for theirs. I became obsessed with this material, adopting it as my own and taking it with me when I moved back to Boston after graduating from college. My methods of preserving my grandmother's story would have appalled any professional archivist. These were documents and photographs that should have been handled in a clean environment and stored in boxes that were waterproof and fire resistant and let in no light. These were delicate, worn pieces of paper. And yet here I was sitting on my bedroom floor, moving them from one pile to another and storing them in manila folders with little to no protection. I digitized and organized it all plucking it from the past and placing it into my present. I learned my grandmother's handwriting. She used the same shaky cursive to caption her photographs as she did to write letters to friends, while titles were always written in block capitals. I scanned every photograph. I retyped every diary. Every word went from her fingertips to my own. I paid close attention to the names and places I found in the archive. These details were found on the backs of photographs, on official documents within the pages of journals and on stamped letters sent from one country to another. I listed the names chronologically and took note of how she had gotten from one place to another and which train station she had stopped at. When my grandmother started telling me her story, she said she had felt like she was going on a big adventure. That's what her archive felt like as well. I began buying books about World War II and the Holocaust. It is the most well-documented genocide from the side of the perpetrators and the victims. I learned the basic facts quickly. World War II began on September 1st, 1939, when the Nazis invaded Poland from the West. Yeah. A few weeks after that, the Soviet Union invaded from the East. The persecution of the Jews started far before that. I taught myself about the roots of anti-Semitism and the rise of the Nazis. It felt like a puzzle. The history books helped me understand my grandmother's story and my grandmother's story helped me understand the history books. Jumping ahead. With each new photograph I scanned or diary entry I transcribed, I became more and more committed to my grandmother's story. It had been almost four years since Hannah had died <clears throat> and I spent too many years buried in her story to not let it take me somewhere. So I decided I would literally follow in her footprints I would live in every country she had lived in. I would travel the way she had. I would track down all the characters from her journals, all the names listed in her letters and documents. And most importantly, I would try to find the people who had saved her life. In her diary, my grandmother called the Holocaust 
an incomprehensible black page of history. I wanted to know what happens when you turn the page. So that's, thank you. That was how, um, that's how it all began. And that was in 2014. And I set out on the road after these four years of um, digitizing and researching and just all, you know, fundraising and all this stuff. Um, and I set out what I thought would be for a year. And I had this very naive notion that I would travel for a year and come back home and write a book. And that was 2014, 2015. Um, and the, the, the documenting process, this, you know, the story collecting process, uh, the living the story process um, would go on, I mean, I would say until even now, but um, a couple major things would happen in the years that follow and not to give too much away for folks who haven't read the book, but I went through um, a very serious loss of someone in my life that changed the context of my grandmother's story, uh, but also the refugee crisis broke out um, in 2015, 2016 in Europe. And you had, you know, hundreds of thousands of migrants coming up through Europe and into Scandinavia, where I was spending a lot of my, my time researching. And so you had all of these current events coming into play with history. And so I got really interested um, in, in how you know, World War II was playing out today, but also I was living with all these descendants of people who saved my grandmother's life and studying the stories of rescue missions. So all of this gets woven into the story. And um, in 2019, uh, the podcast came out, which was my first collaboration with USC Shoah Foundation, who I work with uh, quite a bit and be happy to talk about. Um, and then in the book came out this past summer. Um, and now, now that that's done, I'm starting to work on some other projects. So that's kind of where I'm at. That's a brief overview or a medium uh, version of a short overview or something like that of this project, which has now been, you know, almost a decade and a half of my life. And um, I look forward to talking with you all about it. And thank you also for having me. Um, and so Danny, I'm going to send it back to you now. So uh, thank you, Rachel. So a couple of things. So David and uh, myself have the questions. Uh, David's going to uh, start off, but um, you, you read your grandmother's letter to you when you were three years old, and she referenced the state of the world. And how long ago was that? What year was that? 1992. So who's going to math? It's about 30 20 years, years ago. ago. 30, 30 years, years ago. ago. 30. 30, 30 years ago. Yeah. yeah. 30 years ago. And all you can think of is Ukraine and today. Nothing's really changed. You yeah. could almost just substitute the words and nothing's really changed. It's 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 quite something. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's quite something. It 30 is. years ago, she talked about the state of the world and the refugees and the presidential election and the Israeli situation. And Ukraine. Someone's not on mute, so please, please, please stay on mute. Um, so to me, that I don't know if that's good. It's probably not a good thing, but it's how it is. So, um, so we're going to start with uh, David, who's prepared some. Um, as I know, David, a very good friend, some well thought out questions, and then I'll follow up. Okay. Well, um, actually, uh, Danny, uh, Rachel, again, it's so nice to see you and to hear your story. And, you know, each time I hear it and I read the book and I was familiar with the story even before a book came into uh, being. But uh, there's always something more that I learn each time I hear it and think about it. And in fact, um, you know, Danny, uh, you took words out of my mouth because as you read the portion that you read, uh, with Hannah's observation of the situation, uh, my thoughts immediately went to uh, to the world situation today in Ukraine. And um, I just might want to follow up on those comments by asking uh, Rachel, what do you think your Hannah, your grandmother Hannah would say about that right now? Um, let's, I just want to start with that particular question and throw it to you because it's, she'd be somebody who uh, uh, has had uh, deja vu all over again. And how would you, how do you think it would make her feel or think? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think the associations are those that, 
you know, it's hard not to make if you're paying attention right now. And I'll say that those associations of, you know, being able, Danny, as you said, you know, to, to, to swap, you know, just words in and out. I mean, that's something that I've been struggling with far before what happened in Ukraine. I mean, I felt the same, you know, five, six years ago when you had, you know, Syrians fleeing and Afghans and, you know, all these folks coming from the Middle East and North Africa into Europe was when I really had to pause and reflect on this story and say, okay, well, you know, what, what is the reason I tell a story like this? Like what, what, why did my grandmother leave her story behind? Which I think is a question that a lot of descendants, you know, go into this work with, with that questioning of like, what does this mean today for me now? Um, and my grandmother had a really gifted way of taking her specific life experience and placing it into a much larger context. So she she was a gifted storyteller in that sense where it's like, you know, you, you dive into the very intimate to look at a very global situation. Um, and I, I mean, I what would she be saying now is something that I mean, I think about it all the time and I probably don't have a good answer, but I, th I think she would be sitting here with the rest of us being like, what do I need to learn? Whose stories do I need to listen to? How do I practice empathy? Who, who can I give some extra kindness to? Like, but also while trying to figure out what her active role is in all of this, um, I think the feeling that a lot of us have, which is kind of, you know, feeling like, our hearts jumping out of our body and like our minds, you know, our, our heads, you know, minds jumping out of our heads, you know, however we want to say it. Whereas it's hard to wrap your head around. It's hard to fathom. And it's also hard to balance the desire to protect ourselves from all the horrible things happening in the world, you know, with, with the, you know, the desire to, to want to be active and, and be out there. So I think she would be struggling with it with in the way that all of us are, which is, you know, what role do I play in this situation right now? Like where, where's my responsibility and how can I help? And what does that look like? And how do I stay sane in the process? Um, you know, and with my grandmother's story, it starts with, it can never happen here. And I think about that a lot because my grandmother was born in Czechoslovakia in 1925, which is seven years after Czechoslovakia came to be as a country, which was born out of World War I. And, you know, it wasn't so many years after she was born that Hitler comes to power and within six months of being elected in Germany, it turns, a, you know, a dictator, a democracy into a one party dictatorship. And for all those years of the 30s, Czechoslovakia, their neighbor, at least, you know, from my grandmother's perspective, the story was it can never happen here. And then, of course, we know what happens in Czechoslovakia was actually um, the first country, one of the first countries to be occupied by the Nazis. It was occupied March of 1939 before the war even began. But the way that Czechoslovakia started getting occupied was that in uh, the fall of 1938, Hitler was demanding this area called the Sudetenland, which he claimed was ethnically German and that he had a right to. And he was telling these European leaders, like, just give me this area and I, you know, I won't make war. And they actually signed a document called the Munich Agreement where he stays then, then six months later, you know, takes all of Czechoslovakia. So even when you start to boil down into some of that, there's like some very eerie um, connections to be made between past and present or, you know, symbols to be to be looking for, patterns to be looking for. Um, but yeah, I don't think that's a satisfying answer, but I, I think that she would be sitting here with the rest of us asking herself the same questions of like, what do I do? What, you know, what, what do I do right now? What is my role? Well, you know, to follow up on that uh, as well, uh, you know, we we are aware that in essence, the free world uh, was uh, standing by as the tragedy was unfolding. And in a sense, again, that's uh, uh, history repeating itself. Um, but I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts or you could put yourself in Hannah's position, but knowing what we already know, um, do you feel that the, uh, the free world is responding as it should, um, given uh, the, this tragedy, or how do you look upon that? Man, it's so it's it's so hard to say. Um, yeah. You know, I there's a reason I went into like long term documentary work. Right, it took me like ten years to process what happened seventy five years ago um, to try to understand. You know, the repercussions and all of the players. I mean, I think there's just so much we don't know right now, um, and everybody's involved, whether they 
want to be or not. And we don't know how our neighbors, you know, whether they're our direct neighbors or neighbors across the seas are going to react. So I think it's hard to say at this point, you know, I, I, I like history because you got hindsight and right now we don't have a hindsight. Um, I will say though, that where a lot of my efforts are being focused right now with storytelling and a lot of what I'm just thinking about and trying to wrap my head around is how, like, what do we need to do from prevent this from getting worse? Like we already know what's happened and what mentality do we need to take? Because like I said before, I think it's pretty natural that we all want to protect ourselves in some way from reality sometimes. Um, and this might not be a situation where that's something that anybody can do because we're all going to be roped into this. We, I mean, we already are. Um, so I don't know, I, you know, I can't speak on political strategy. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't have that type of um, education or that, that sphere of intelligence to really speak to professionally on, you know, political policy. But I think it's really good that the folks are reacting. I think it's really important that we continue to pay attention and that if things get a bit better, we don't stop paying attention or if they seem to be getting a bit better. Um, I think there's a very long, I, I think we have a long road ahead. And so staying very active and aware and continuing to educate ourselves um, and looking how events have played out in the past is, um, you know, at least something that each of us could do individually. Let me, let me just um, uh, move away from uh, Ukraine for a moment in a sense that, you know, I think there's a point in uh, all of our lives where we become interested in family history or roots um, and uh, also maybe learning more about the history of the era that our, uh, our uh, kinfolk lived in. And you did something which I uh, is so unique in that, and as you began your search of uh, your family's history and the history of the era, um, you actually retraced the steps. You spent a year living it, not just researching it. And I'm just wondering for, for those of us who are also interested or become interested in family history and history of the era, um, could we really learn things um, by doing the research without researching with our feet? Maybe not spending the entire year and developing the relationships that you did, but um, actually traveling to the source and experiencing things on the ground, even if they are um, after images of what occurred because people may not be there that we can connect with, but just curious about what advice you have for those who are also interested in genealogy and, you know, connecting more with their family's past. Yeah, um, I think it's just, I think it's a lifelong effort. I think like once you get interested in where your family comes from, it's not like a interest that gets satisfied very easily or ever. I think that the more we learn, the more questions we have, you know, we start to figure out oh, we're related to this person, what's their family tree related to this person and what history impacted me here, what culture and what food and this and that. Um, so I think that trying to put like, any time a box around what it looks like to research it is just kind of like is uh I, I think that it's, it's unproductive for us um and I think there's two there's two like kind of a just to very simplify it two avenues of your family history research which is one I'm just super interested and this is a hobby and I'm gonna do it and then two lots of folks like myself were said like I actually want to publish something with this like I want to you know put this out into the world and in, in a in a more um you know, professional way. And those are two different processes. But I always say that I could have written a book about my grandmother without ever leaving my home. Like I, I could have written a biography that was 600 pages about her, no problem. Um, she personally left behind so much, which is not also every family's situation. So then you have these, uh, you know, to create another bucket of, of different family experiences, you have the folks who have so much information, they feel a little bit overwhelmed with the responsibility of how to carry it forward. And then you have families who are lacking information and are asking themselves, you know, how do I connect to like where I come from without a lot being, you know, put in front of me to search through. So I, I personally felt like as a photographer, I knew that I couldn't do the work I wanted to do without going to the places. And it's kind of ironic that 
probably the last thing I do with this project is the visual project because I went audio and then I went the written word and so you know the photographs I use in a lot of public speaking and teaching but not um uh not so much in um not yet as like a, a publication um so I have you know so there's that but I think that going out to a place is so invaluable in it's so valuable in the sense of it brings the first person narrative into the story in a very organic way. When you go somewhere, you, when you have the experience of travel in whatever capacity it is, and you step down somewhere and you put yourself in that place and you smell the air and you take a photograph or you witness it with a family member, suddenly that story is continuing in a very like physical manner. So when you start to tell that story, now, not only are you passing down the story of your ancestors and who came before and where they came from as it was told to you, but you're actually adding to the memory. You're adding depth and texture to the memory of saying, like, I was here and, and this is what it felt like to me. And now suddenly you're a part of the story. And I think that's just incredibly valuable. It, it's what, you know, why history isn't in the past. Um, and so I, I definitely encourage for people to go. I um, do not think anybody should necessarily try to replicate what I did because I couldn't even try to replicate what I did at this point. It was very much a time and place in my life of being in my 20s and being nomadic. And, you know, I went out for a year and I ended up on the road for multiple, like many, many years. Um, and yeah, living with all these families. And also a large part of why I was able to do what I did is that I happened to find people in the story who cared as much as I did. And that, you know, so it was really a mutual process. So as much as I was out there on my own, it was not something I could have done on my own. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I hope that's helpful in some regard. <laughs> no, it is. I think you may have sparked interest in people making journeys. Uh, based I on hope what so. Yes. I, hope I, I, so. I have one more uh, question and then I, I don't want to dominate this because I'm sure, you know, our uh, attendees tonight will have their own, but, um, you know, we, we now have more displaced persons and refugees in the world now since the end of the Second World War. So people are on the move and they're looking for safe havens. And this is particularly uh, poignant at this time as we prepare for the Seder when we are um, uh, thinking about strangers in a strange land. But um, your, your grandmother Hannah left uh, at 14 with an uncertain journey uh, of um, in front of her and managed to uh, find ways to survive and reinvent herself in different countries. It was quite, quite an experience. If, if she, what do you think, or uh, could you imagine if, if, if she had to speak to uh, uh, one of the Ukrainians or the Syrians displaced and looking for a place to go now, uh, based on her experience, do you, what, what, what could you imagine she would say to them as encouragement as they face a very uncertain path ahead? Oh, my grandmother was very independent in how she made her decisions. And you see that throughout her story. Um, because she wasn't in a camp, because she was saved by strangers, and because she found refuge in a country that First, she was in Denmark, um, and then in 1943, when Denmark was no longer safe, she was part of the rescue of the Danish Jews and was in Sweden, which was neutral. So, you know, compared to everyone she left behind, you know, she was in places that were relatively safe during war. So she had certain opportunities, and she really made the most of her opportunities. So in the early years of the war, she's in Denmark, and um, after an I'm not going to go into all the details of how she got there and why and what she was doing, but um, around 1942, you know, she'd been there for a few years. Her Danish was getting good enough. She'd been living on these farms and working as like a farm help, and she wanted to go to school. Uh, that was one of the first things that was taken away from her, which is you see in many oppressive regimes is that education is one of the first things stripped. And so her schooling stopped when she was 13. And she really wanted to go back and get an education. Her father had always told her what, you know, what's in your head, no one can take away from you. So she starts writing to these schools and there weren't many options for women at the time. So she writes to this, uh, these finishing schools, which essentially is like to teach you how to be a proper lady and run a household. 
And she eventually gets accepted into a school under the condition that she'll be like essentially their janitor, their custodian. She's cleaning the toilets and washing the walls and, you know, doing all the custodial work in exchange for an education. And so I bring up that story because it's very uh, symbolic of how my grandmother survived during the many years um, in her life where she was on her own. And my, my story actually is not necessarily focused on the years of the Holocaust, even though that's a big part of it, but I was really focused on her years of statelessness because she was stateless for 17 years. So I follow her story from uh, 1939 through 1956, which is six years after she arrives in this country. So she has over and over and over again in her life, these instances where she just takes what's in front of her and she figures out how to make it work for her. And my guess is, is that if she was taught, cause she later in life, like as, a, as an older woman, she would teach English as a second language to newcomers in America. And I know that she had a very strong, she had a strong personality and a strong attitude around the, the fact that she had to do it on her own and she had to figure it out. And I think she'd have a little bit of like, you know, a huge dose of compassion and a little bit of reality check for folks going through it today where I think she would relay, I mean, you know, I'm being so, you know, I'm just, I, I, I can't say what she actually would have done, but you know, what I think in my heart today would be, you know, I, I imagine that she would have a little bit of this like independent streak attitude to pass down to them and being like, you can do it. Like you figure it out and you're going to do it. And I think it would be a little bit of tough love with a lot of compassion. Um, that's kind of, I don't know, that that's, that's, I, I, I don't know, I, th I think if I know her well, I think she would, she would come in a little bit like that. Yeah. Well, her example would be inspirational for those who uh, really don't see a way at this particular point. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. And I, I think so too. And I, I think she would be able to speak their language in a way that I couldn't, you know, and, and I'm not talking about language, language, but they'd be able to understand each other without, without even using words. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. So and maybe yeah. we'll moderate, uh, yeah. giving others a chance. So to let's a uh, couple, couple of things. So I already have a question in the chat. If you have a question uh, for Rachel, um, I think it's best to put it in the chat right now, and I will feed those questions to Rachel. But here's my question to you. Uh, you do have some questions in the back, which we can ask, but here's my question. So you are a grand child of someone who went through the Shoah, not necessarily a concentration camp, but you're certainly what we would call a 3G. So David and myself and Varda, who's on the call, and several others of us that are on this call are children of survivors, or what we call 2Gs. What we have found that we're actually working on a project, and what we've discovered is that the next generation, and certainly the generation after yours, is not as tied into the Shoah. Doesn't mean as much. It's ancient. It's ancient history. Same with Israel. It's it's a different mindset. Right, wrong, or different. That's just how it is. What motivated you? I don't know if you had siblings. I don't remember, but I gotta believe that you took your grandmother's story a little more. To, to heart more than the other people in your family. And we all have that. We all have different people in our families that some kind of like, yeah, kind of like that. And then some that, I mean, you took it to the extreme. <laughs> you, went to, you went to Europe, you went to Israel, you went to Scandinavia, but you crossed the country. But what motivated you to do all this? Was it just in your neshama, just in your soul? What, what was it that, that, that made you, that sparked this? Yeah, it was um, a little bit of everything, the right combination of everything, I think. Um, and I will say, I, I would say that um, just to speak to the 2G versus 3G difference, because it is, it's an incredibly different way to inherit this history. Um, I do think that folks of my generation, particularly as they're having kids uh, and the next generation, I think it does mean as much, it just means something different. And I, I think there's a question of what that is. Same goes for the conversation of Israel. Of course, that's a very generalization, but I do find that more and more, like I get emails constantly from grandchildren who are, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what they want to do with their grandparents' story. Um, but I'll say, yeah, I think, you know, for me, this interest definitely peaked a little bit earlier than I think most people who get interested in their family history. Um, 
but I think it was really the perfect combination of knowing my grandmother had a really interesting story and knowing that I could tell it in a way that was personal that I couldn't tell other stories. And I was going into a professional storytelling field. So I was already kind of like thinking of the world as stories. Um, I was really interested, like I said, I, I was really interested at that time and still am in displaced communities, statelessness, uh, refugee experiences, what it means to be part of a diaspora community. I find the cultures of diaspora communities to be really interesting. So those were all things that, those were all the types of stories I was interested in already as a young person um, and memory. And I'll say it's it's kind of funny because um, this past fall was the uh, was the 20th anniversary of my bat mitzvah. And so anybody from the Boston area, if you know Temple Sinai, that's where I grew up in Brookline next to Trader Joe's. Um, and I came back and I, I gave a talk because my book had just come out. And I gave a talk on the 20th anniversary of my, my bat mitzvah. And the parsha was Lech Lecha, which is when, you know, God tells Abraham to go forth and, you know, go find a homeland. And, and I was, I was, as a 12 year old, I had like told my mother, I was like very adamant that if I was going to have a bat mitzvah, cause I grew, you know, that this was the parsha I wanted to do. And I was not a religious kid. I grew up in a like reform community. I didn't know that much about the Torah, but even as like a 12 year old, I was very drawn to this story of a journey. And I was very drawn to this idea of having to go forth and what it means to find at, like to leave, to find out where is home. And so clearly these were things I was interested in as a kid. My favorite childhood book was The Giver, um, which was written by Lois Lowry, which is all about, you know, kind of a utopian society passing stories from one generation to the next. So, you know, it's like funny when I, when I went back to give this talk uh, this past fall, I, I went back to my bat mitzvah speech that I still have. And like, literally it's like the forward of my book. Like it's like my grandmother when she was 14 had to leave home and da, da, da. so like this, you know, I, I didn't even remember that when I started this project, but clearly this, this was inside of me. It made me and my mom laugh a lot. I was like, I guess I've just always been doing this. Um, but then, you know, I, yeah, I think that it was just the, the project kept smiling. So I just kept becoming more interested in what it meant. And like, as all of these characters started coming into play and, um, you know, I started meeting all these people and the descendants of people who saved her life and moving in with them and them welcoming me in and wanting to talk about it and telling me about how their family passed down the story. And I just kept finding that in all these spaces that, you know, the story kind of morphed into this thing that was very present day. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that as the story shifted, I just, kept being um, a little bit of increasingly obsessed with it. And I do have, I do have a brother who, you know, is perfectly interested as a normal grandchild would be. Um, and I have cousins who all had their own relationships with my grandma, parent, with my grandmother, probably closer with her during her life than I was because I lived far away. Um, but I do, th I do also think that there's tends to be one person in every family, or at least of each generation that follows it, you know, takes it in a little bit differently. And so I, I guess in my family, that's me, but I'll also say in my mom's generation, it was my mom. So um, maybe the apple doesn't fall far from the tree there. So, yeah. Oh, you're muted, Danny. Good point. <laughs> uh, and by the way, my bar is portion and my son's was so I can really? definitely relate. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Um, I have a couple of questions here and I'm not gonna go in a chronological order because right along the lines of what we're talking about. Um, did your family support you in your efforts? Did you get support from your family? Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, you know, what the word support mean has changed over the years, but they've always, um, you know, emotionally supported me in terms of just yeah, being like, go, go for it. Like, you know, not a lot of parents are totally cool with their kid just running around, you know, the world without having a home and being like, I don't need to have an apartment and pay rent. And like, I don't need a job that pays me. I mean, you know, it was, it was a lot of years of like nomadic, I don't know where I'm going next. Uh, and my parents are very supportive of that. Both my mom and my dad are very interested in family history. So I had good thought partners in them. Um, my father is a theologian and a historian, 
and his expertise is like Native American genocide in New England, you know, so I had all of these influences coming from the generation um, above me that made it very, uh, it made it feel like a very supportive environment. And then on top of that, during some of those nomadic years, when I would come back to Boston area, my parents were very generous to let me to let me live in their basement. So <laughs> that was that was helpful as well. That's great. That's great. So um, even though we're the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, there's a woman whose name is Lisa Pollack, who actually runs FJMC. She's like the boat, she's like the glue of the organization. And she's on this call tonight. And uh, I'm going to read you her question or her comment. Rachel, it's a pleasure meeting you. I'm currently reading your book, and I'm deeply moved by your grandmother's story. You're a brilliant writer and your storyteller, and you put your heart and soul into this book. With the state of the world today, especially with the atrocities in Ukraine, everyone should be reading your grandmother's story. I imagine as a photographer and visionary, you would want to turn your book into a documentary film. So the question is, do you? <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, it's like funny because I started this as a first of all, Lisa, thanks for being here and thank you for the question. Um, I, you know, I started this as a photo project. So like, you know, that was that was always where, you know, my my first interest. And in, and you know, and when I was going around all of Europe and when I was moving in with these people, like I was moving in with the question of like, can I photograph you? Like, so that was my in in many ways. It was also my relationship with a lot of people who I didn't share a language with. So visual storytelling has been a really big part of my collection process. I have over a hundred thousand photographs in the archive for this project. So it's it's an overwhelming uh, task, but I'm here for it. Um, I am working, you know, I do a lot of work in education. Uh, so my photographs come with me into classrooms a lot. And like for younger students, I'll print them out and they'll get to cut them up and make scrapbooks of my grandmother's life. So all the photographs are like serving purposes, but um, a documentary would be really cool. I'm playing around with like, whether it'd be a documentary, feature film, is it both? But I'm also interested in jumping off of some of the themes that my grandmother's story had introduced me to, like, I'd be really interested to start to um, follow stories of other women who have migrated on their own, and what it looks like for matriarchs of families. And, you know, the, the, the woman, you know, to, to migrate on your own as a woman is a special experience. And so I'm, I'm interested how that plays out from other, you know, war torn places and cultures. Um, so we'll see if we'll see if a documentary ends up being the story itself or or something that's tangentially connected. Um, but another exciting thing in the works is I'm starting to work on a museum exhibit, like a traveling museum exhibit that would take all of the assets, like all of all of the primary source documents, the old photographs from the 1940s of my grandmother with these groups of refugees in Denmark, um, the photographs I've taken, the audio, the education. So. Um, Something's a brewing. It's coming. <laughs> Fantastic. You're extraordinary. So the name of the book, name of the podcast is We Share the Same Sky. Yes. So the question is, why did you choose that title? What does it mean? So normally I have no problem talking about this, but since there might be folks reading the book that might not have gotten to that place yet, I'm a little bit hesitant <laughs> for spoilers. So I'm going to give a very vague answer if it's okay. Um, yeah, sure. um, which is, it's not what you think. And it comes from someone who is not directly related to my grandmother, but is all about grief. And it's all about saying goodbye. And it's all about um, having some hope when things feel very sad. So like I said, normally I'm very into talking about it, but um, I don't want to spoil it for folks who are in the middle of the book. So, but you'll, you'll find out in there and in the podcast as well. Terrific. Okay. Well, that was extraordinary. That was extremely moving. We thank you for your time. It was very, very poignant. Every time, like David said, we read the book, we get a different perspective. You're quite an extraordinary individual. We look forward to uh, continuing to work with you. Uh, thank you for this. We wish everyone a very 
despite all the crap in the world, we do hope and have always have hope as a Jewish people. And we hope that everyone has a meaningful Pesach. It's coming up very quickly. Um, and then uh, Yom HaShoah will be at the end of the month. So we do encourage everyone to um, light a yellow candle or any kind of candle um, and, and keep the memory alive. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.